and I, now I'd like to uh, turn to uh, our seventh session uh, of the conference. Uh, this one uh, focused on communities of readers. Uh, and I'll introduce both of our panelists uh, now, uh, and then they can each proceed with, with their presentations. Uh, our first speaker is Julianne Lamont. She's a lecturer in English at the Australian uh, National University, where her research and teaching focus on Australian literature and the history of books, readers, and audiences. She's published essays on reading communities, digital approaches to the history of reading, gender and literary value in Australia, uh, and the reception and circulation of works by a range of 19th century Australian writers, including Rosa Prade, am I saying that right? Uh, Steele Rudd, Barbara Bainton, and Miles Franklin. Our second speaker uh, is Christine Pauley. Uh, she is the form uh, former professor and director of the School of Library and Information Sciences and former director of the Center for the History of Print and Digital Culture at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, her publications include Reading on the Middle Border, The Culture of Print in Late 19th Century, 19th Century Osage, uh, published in 2001, um, and Reading Place, Osage, Iowa, I should say, um, Reading Places, Literacy, Democracy, and the Public Library in 20th Century America, published in 2010. She's currently working on a history of progressive era women's institutional involvement in print culture, tentatively titled Organizing Women, Print Culture, and Community Power in Early 20th Century America. So I'll turn it over to Julianne, uh, and then we'll hear from Christine. So right. Thanks very much, Jim. Yeah. So this, this project, and this is a project that's still at a fairly early stage, um, is driven by two questions that have come up quite a bit over the last day and a half. Um, the first one is something that Pat mentioned yesterday, and this is uh, this idea of local, local circuits of value. Um, and in my case, I'm thinking particularly about local circuits of cultural value and how they intersect with broader global or transnational um, circuits of, of cultural value and also perhaps transnational markets, uh, literary markets. And of course, thinking about cosmopolitanism in a colonial context, so I'm shifting the focus here across the world to Australia, um, just after uh, Australia's federation. So thinking about cosmopolitanism in a colonial context is a bit different in that this is a situation in which movement between centre and periphery, both physical movement but also imaginative movement, is kind of a condition of people's everyday lives. So it's a slightly different um, kind of consideration, I think. Um, and in reconstructing these local, uh, these local circuits of value, I'm, I'm trying to do something that was really inspired by Christine's work, actually, in thinking about the social context for reading and the social aspects of reading. And in particular, I've been thinking about what is the, the precondition for sort of literary sociability, people having, being able to have conversations about books, and that is what they've read in common. So that's sort of the key question I'm thinking about, is communities of readers defined by what they've read in common, so reading, common reading practices. Okay, so I'm going to take us across time and place, Lambton, Australia. And this photo was taken in 1908. So Lambton was one, Lambton is in the Newcastle region of New South Wales, which was established as a, as a um, coal mining region. Um, and this was during the, there was a coal mining boom in Australia from the 1850s through to about the 1880s, 1890s. Um, and continuing, sort of declining slowly into the 20th century. Um, so this is Lampton. It was one of a number of little um, coal mining communities um, scattered around. And the most important thing, I think, for our purposes to know about Lampton is that it was established by, um, by Scottish, uh, Scottish investment in a, a Scottish coal mining company, and most of its inhabitants were, uh, were uh, immigrants from coal mining areas of Britain, so largely Wales. Um, and so this is just an example. This is Britannia Day in the, in the uh, Lampton public school in 1900 to give you a sense of that that sense of, of identification with uh, with a British identity rather than necessarily an Australian one so we're really thinking about a trans transplanted communities of readers and that's particularly interesting when we're looking at Welsh miners who themselves have a strong tradition of having of workers libraries and autodidacticism and in a sense we can see some of these readers are transplanted Welsh autodidact miners in a colonial um, circumstance and that's quite interesting okay so here we have the Lampton Mechanics and Miners Institute. So Mechanics and Miners Institute, uh, it's, it's a movement that came out of Britain. Um, it was very prevalent um, and successful in Australia, largely because uh, public libraries outside of, the, um, metropo outside of the metropolitan capitals were not common in Australia until the late 1930s. So that's a very different circumstance from the American circumstance. So we didn't have a strong, um, a strong network of 
public libraries and instead what we had were these mechanics and miners institutes or schools of art um, which were basically institutes established for workers education um, and as most most people who most historians of the movement have put it for workers sort of pacification you know this idea that you educate the workers to try and kind of calm them down and make sure they're not too fractious um, and in most cases and Lampton was not unusual in this workers resisted any attempt to be educated by just reading large amounts of trash um, which is mostly what happened in Lampton so light fiction was mostly what was read here um, and it was not, not successful in pacifying them either, they were very strongly unionised um, throughout this period. Okay. So another interesting thing about um, the, this, this institute, as many of the institutes, I don't know if you can read that at the back, but this is, this is um, an, a notice from the library and it's a list of the periodicals that were held. Now the, um, the committee, the library committee had strong arguments about what periodicals should be held and ordered and you can see, can you read that at the back or not so much? There's a list of colonial publications and then English and foreign and among the English and foreign we have um, Chambers Journal, Castles, Family Herald, Glasgow Weekly Mail, Graphic, Harper's, Illustrated London News, London Journal, 19th Century and so on. So a range, a range of, um, of uh, periodicals from elsewhere. And the other thing to note about this is that a large amount of the fiction that was being read in Australia and as elsewhere in this period was in periodicals. So serialised novels, so novels both from Australia and elsewhere were being read in these periodicals. We can't know what or how they weren't borrowed, they were held in a, in a reading room. Um, but I think it's, it's indicative of this other kind of, this other reading that we can't really get to yet, this sense of this periodical, this serialised periodical reading. So in terms of what they read, um, this is a graph of the most popular authors at Lambton and it's by the proportion of total loans per year of the works by the, these authors. And I was interested today um, listening to Lynn and thinking also about Christine's work. Um, there was not, um, this sense of belated reading was not apparent in, these, in Australian libraries. They were reading um, work that was generally had a lag of about a year, a year or, or two years. So they were reading, even though they were far flung from any kind of literary centre, they were reading quite recent work. Um, so, so uh, from writers who are very popular across the world, Oppenheim, um, to local writers who you probably wouldn't have heard of. Nat Gould was a very, uh, a very famous writer of sporting adventures, Australian writer. Um, Baroness Oxy, Horace Vachel. Um, I've left out the Hockings um, because there are two of them and I couldn't separate them out. But Alan Rain, who is a, um, a writer of Welsh-themed romances, was very popular, unsurprisingly, in a community where there were many, many Welsh immigrants. Um, so this was one of uh, seven libraries that are held in the Australian Common Reader database, which I'll, sorry, I'll just um, see if I can bring up for you. There it is. Okay, so this is a database kind of like um, what Middletown read, but perhaps not as good in some senses. Um, it's, it's, it's a broader library in that it has um, it, a broader database and it has holdings from seven libraries you can see here um, they're the seven libraries and they roughly and they're mostly uh, workers institutes along in, along the lines of Lampton and the time period ranges from 1860 to 1912 so they cross sort of the turn of the late 19th and the turn of the 20th century so I just wanted to show you that um, okay can I go back to my PowerPoint oh where's it going Uh oh, sorry, I've just lost my PowerPoint. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Okay. There we go. Okay, good. Um, so I think there's lots of scope for comparison across the Common Reader database and what Middletown read in terms of thinking about patterns of readership. So I just wanted to show you that. Um, it's not as well structured, I think, as the Middletown database, and we don't have as much demographic information for the patrons, but we do have some some demographic information. So when I, was, um, when I found this database, I was talking to my partner about this who happens very fortuitously to be a computer scientist. And I was, we had one of those conversations across the, across the disciplinary divide where I was trying to explain, this is what I want to understand. And he was going to, trying to work out how to help me do that. And what I was trying to understand is the extent of reading in common in this library. So whether this library constitutes one big community of readers, you know, who had a lot in common, or whether there were discrete communities who had little to do with each other's reading. Um, and it turns out it's a, it's a bit of both. Um, so 
there are a few things that he suggested to me to do. And this one, I think, is probably one of the most useful things um, in terms of understanding the pattern of reading. It's a histogram um, which plots the frequency of the number of, um, the number of times each of the books in the database was borrowed. Um, so how many times, you know, for a book that was only borrowed once through to a book that was borrowed, I think, 34 times was the, mo was the book that was borrowed the most in the database. And what this tells us is that a large proportion of the borrowing in this database was not of the most popular books. So it's a kind of a counterintuitive thing. It's a very long tail in the borrowing. A lot of books, a lot of borrowing was of books that were only borrowed one to, to five or one to ten times. So what that tells us is the way that we approach these databases tend, tends to be, okay, what were the most popular books? But this actually, what this shows is that thinking about the 10 or 20 or 40 most popular books ignores a huge amount of the borrowing that was actually going on. So that tells us that we have to look in other ways to try and think about what was actually happening in these libraries. What this also tells us, I think, is something about the extensiveness of the reading that was happening. And there, I'm, I'm not sure whether this is the case with what Middletown read, but in this library, there, there, were, there were very extensive readers. So Evan Trahan, who was a Welsh miner, who was the, who was the most frequent borrower, borrowed books by 189 different authors. Know, which, is a, which is a very extensive, I think, you know, 189 different authors. Um, and that's, I mean, here's, here's the extreme case, but there were many borrowers who borrowed works from, uh, say, 100 different authors. So that's, I, that seems to be quite extensive to me, but I'd be interested to compare that with what other people have found. Um, so in thinking about, I'm probably going to skip this slide very quickly. Um, this is about the, the kind of definition of similarity we're thinking about in terms of borrowers and readers. So we're thinking about borrowers being similar in terms of the books that they've borrowed and books being similar in terms of the borrowers that they've borrowed. So this is thinking about communities of readers in, in terms of similarity, just in terms of reading practices. Um, oh, that's gone a bit skew with. Um, <laughs> so, hmm, I'll see if I can fix, fix that. Sorry, something funny has happened to my PowerPoint. Um, oh yeah, okay. Sorry, I'll just try and move my picture. Ah, oh. not sure why that's happened. Hmm. All right, I'll paint you a word picture. Um, so, what what this is, what I, what Mark has done um, with this, this is basically do a thing um, called network analysis. And I'm not sure, Brad, if it's similar to what you're doing, but basically um, he structured. Okay, I need a whiteboard. He's basically, um, oh, okay, can I show, I don't know if you can see, um, but basically what he's done is structure the whole database as a graph, um, a tripartite graph with three, um, with three columns. One is the books, one is the, one is the um, borrowers, and one is the authors, and drawing connections between each of those things. You know, so if, a, if a, someone has borrowed a book, there's a line between those. Um, so basically a way of mapping all the relationships in this data between books and their borrowers. And in doing that, he's able to ask a whole bunch of, we're able to ask a whole bunch of questions. And so I said, well, what, can we find the people who've got at least 50% similarity in what they've borrowed? Um, and so he did, he did this for me. And so he, he asked, okay, we want people who have at least 50% similarity and who have at least 10 books in common. So people who've borrowed at least, you know, a number of books. And what he found was, <laughs> which you can't see, in the middle there is James Scoogle, who's a, um, who is, um, who's a clerk who made 307 loans. He's in the middle there. And these are the people who he has the most in common with. So he shared, across his 10 years, he shared 183 titles with Henry Hemmings, who's a wheelwright. So these are people who shared 183 books that they had in common. So you imagine meeting someone on the street who you had that much of your reading in common with. And so he had about that much in common with, with um, three different people. This is Mabel Grierson, a, a homemaker who had almost that many books in common with Leslie Payne, who was a butcher. Um, and so it just gives, this is a way of thinking about people in this, who in this database had a lot of reading in common with each other. Down the bottom, actually you can see the, the one down the bottom um, <laughs> is, is a little trio, a little, uh, sorry, a little uh, duo, Martha Charlton, who um, I mentioned in my paper, she's the wife of Matthew Charlton, who was actually the fifth leader of the Australian Labor Party, the leader of the opposition and went on to the League of Nations. And what's wonderful about him is that we can track what he was saying in, in Parliament in his public speeches alongside what he was reading year by year, which is fascinating. But his wife, Martha Charlton, was also a very um, extensive reader and also seems to be the centre of a little community of women readers who had quite a lot in common. 
So this is just to show you a few of the approaches that we've been taking to thinking to think about communities of readers. This is another one which you can't see, um, which is very similar, I think, to what Lynn and Stephen were doing. Um, uh, so it's basically, this is an, a visualisation um, plotting, well, there's one with books, one with borrowers, and it basically puts, you know, if, if it's for, this is for the borrowers, they're closer together if they have more in common. And it, what I wanted to say about these kinds of visualisations is that they certainly don't, they don't give us answers, but what they do is provide us with another way of exploring this data to find, to find um, to find connections between readers and books that we wouldn't otherwise find. So it's another way of, of looking at this data um, in a different way. Not right now. Not right now. <laughs> but later, perhaps. Yes, I'm not sure what's happened there. Is this the one that looks like a bunch of helium balloons? Yes, this is the one that looks like a bunch of helium balloons. It looks quite similar to the market basket analysis, um, uh, except that it's much more um, diverse. There aren't, there aren't discrete clusters in the way that you found discrete clusters. And I think that's actually a marker of what was going on in this library. Um, so I'll, I'll move on to the next one. Ah, this one worked. This is actually the least useful one and it worked. Um, this, is <laughs> this is another approach that Mark took called, reading, uh, called um, cluster analysis, which is similarly trying to cluster books together according to, to readers that they have in common. Now these are the less common, these are the books that were, were borrowed less, frequency, less frequently because if you do this analysis for the data as a whole, you basically get a big clump. Almost all of the books are connected to all the other books because of the, the pop, you know, because of the popularity of certain books. But when you take the popular books out, this is a way of looking at the readership of the less popular books. So some of these clusters, and I'll just look at the, at the list for you. These are books that were, oops, sorry, that's the wrong thing. Um, books that were less, less commonly borrowed. So one of the clusters links works by Dumas, Twain, Dickens and Tolstoy. Another links works by Verne, Gaskell, Marcus Clark, who's an Australian, a uh, colonial Australian writer, and Marie Corelli. So these are ways of thinking about how those novels that weren't the really popular mass fiction novels were being read in, in this library. Okay. What determines the shape of that? So the shape of it, basically it's a, it's, um, so it's a graph with, um, with, with nodes and lines similar to, nodes and edges similar to what Stephen was talking about. And the, they're clustered together according to um, how many readers they have in common. So they're clustered together if they have a certain percentage of readers in common. Yeah. So that's those who have, um, I think that's taking out the books that have 206 or more readers in common. So this is sort of a way of, we take out those really popular books and we visualise the, the less popular ones to see who read them in common. Okay, so the very brief conclusions that I've been able to draw from this so far. There are many borrowers with a great deal of borrowing in common in this library. So we don't know whether they, know, they knew one another. I, you know, there's much more research to do, obviously, about how much this was driven by social communities in the way that the kind of work that Christine's done. Um, but there was, you know, if two people met on the street in Lampton, there was a chance that they had a fair bit of their reading in common, and I think that's interesting. Um, there, this has revealed that there are differences in the holdings of Lampton and the other libraries in the database. And libraries, there was another one that was another coal mining community in a different part of Australia. Quite different holdings, quite different loan patterns, which is interesting. Um, the, there was crossover reading, so the borrowing patterns weren't clearly gendered. Um, so men were reading books by women, women were reading books by men. Um, so there weren't, there weren't clear kind of dis gender distinctions in the kind of reading that was happening. Um, and a large proportion of the borrowing was, of the, was not of the most popular books. And I think that's perhaps the most interesting thing that I found is that we need to think about that other borrowing that's taking place underneath the top 10 or top 20 list. Um, and just by way of conclusion, a generally unrecognisable mass. This was a, um, a woman who did a master's thesis on this library. Um, a library, I, I think she was writing, she was a historian. Um, and she looked at the catalogue of Lampton and said, well, these books are a generally unrecognisable mass. You know, they're books that we don't study as literary, as literary critics. Um, and part of, I think, what the next step of this kind of research is to actually go and read, read some of these books to understand. Because at the moment, as I was saying to you, Lydia, the other day, I just have a bunch of lists, but without understanding the kind of literary context of what was going on, uh, there's a limit to how much we can understand. And I think Lydia's book is a really good example of what you can do when you do read the books and understand these kinds of literary contexts. So that's, that's my next step is transforming some of this generally unrecognisable mass into something that we can put in, in its literary and social context. So I think that's it for me. Cheers.
no, you don't want to save a can't wait. Don't save. No. Close that. Close that, and then I'll be able to. There it is. Okay. Let's see if I have run into the same problem you did. I, let's hope not. I'm going to stand up. Um, I hope that's okay with everybody. So I'm hoping that if I stand over here, I can see the screen and without you know having to turn around and you don't see the back of my head all the time. So, um, so I'm going to talk about Clara Steen Scott a little bit, and mostly what I'm going to talk about is the background, the context for this work, and I'm going to spend most times sort of acknowledging my intellectual debts. So. Uh, while we're still on this page, there is Clara Steen Scott, and there is a picture of Iowa State College, now Iowa State University, at about the time when Clara Steen Scott went to college there. And I just love the sheep on campus cropping the grass, which is, of course, how grass was cropped before lawnmowers were invented. So, so this is part of the larger project. Um, sort of informing all my work is the need to link real historical readers with the real historical texts that they read, making that connection. And it occurred to me over several projects of doing this that recovering the reading, particularly of women and other people who kind of don't float to the surface, um, don't have a lot of name recognition, you, it, one needs to interrogate the archive in a slightly different way. Um, very often, women who appear, um, who, who one's interested in finding, don't, are not named in the archive, archival finding aids. And you have to know what their institutional position was in order to find out information about them. So I made that link between women of the progressive era and afterwards, and the institutions that they were part of. And so, Almost all the people in this list would not emerge in an archival finding aid on their own, in their own right. Now, Clara Steen Scott is an, is an exception because uh, it was her diary that um, led me to find out about her reading practices. So, of course, she was a named person. Uh, Mary Imogen Hazeltine, you would need to know that she was, she was the principal of the Wisconsin Library School for first principal of the um, Wisconsin Library School, you'd need to know that she was, that the whole institution, that organization was part of the Wisconsin Free Library Commission. So if you go to those records, those institutional records, you can find out letters from Mary Imogen Hazeltine and so on. Um, the Book Lovers Club of Des Moines, Des Moines Iowa, um, their records are in the YWCA of Des Moines, Des Moines Iowa. So you're looking for book reading groups? Nothing in the archival finding aids about reading groups, but lots about the YWCA. So it was actually only by talking to the archivist that you sort of start to find these. So what I'm saying is that women's history is often buried in a way, and, and, and it would be true of, of men too, but it's particularly true of women because their um, public persona was such to, to a long time to emerge. So. Um, all of these have in common that I'm able to make some link between reading and specific titles in different ways. Um, so here are some themes that are emerging out of these kind of disparate um, chapters. And, and the Clara Steen Scott chapter, what you read was about half of what's going to be the Clara Steen Scott chapter. Um, what did not go into that paper was a, a discussion of the actual books that she read. I allude to them in the paper that you read, but I don't go into them in much detail. So here are some of the themes that are coming out of this work. But what I really particularly want to talk about is the bottom theme that's in a box um, and slightly larger, um, how individuals exercise agency and experience social structure through participating in institutional networks of print. So at this point, I'm going to kind of move away from this project and talk more generally about the theoretical ideas that are informing this work and that I, I do talk about, but not in much detail in the paper. So 
here's where I start um, acknowledging my intellectual debts and start with Don McKenzie, who was known to some people in this room personally and to probably all of us um, by reputation. And so on this page, there are, I think, three points that I'm taking away from Don McKenzie's work. So the first is that he points us to the roles of institutions. So, all right, check. That's what I'm working on. Um, and then he talks about the human uh, motives and interactions which texts involve at every stage of their production, transmission, and consumption. So that um, we need to pay attention to that tripartite um, process, which gets complicated uh, by people who write after Mackenzie. But I also want to point to the use of this word sociology and to say that for me, um, the writings of sociological theorists have been very helpful in thinking about issues of power and agency in the realm of print culture. So I'm going to move on. And I apologize to those of you who have a background in sociology um, to talk about what I see as a sort of a central problem that we as print culture um, historians, literary historians, uh, have to struggle with. Um, that I try to bear in mind while I'm writing these different kinds of chapters. And that central problem is what sociologists call the macro-micro problem. And so I apologize to you if this is very familiar to you. This is kind of, this is a very quick and elementary uh, walkthrough we're going to take. So how do you explain social events? Um, how do we um, think about how individuals relate to society? So the macro approach sees um, individuals as shaped by society using these large-scale social constructs. Um, we see that individuals are more or less um, shaped by the uh, events around them and the dimensions that help us explain those are things like gender, race, and class. So this is an uh, approach that emphasizes social structure. And here we have a famous example of Robert Danton. Um, I've simplified his well-known communication circuit because I know you can't really read it from the back. Um, but his is a very structural view. You know, it's a bird's eye view. He takes these... He black boxes these various functions. It's a very functionalist view. Um, and he puts in these arrows, so he sees the process starting with authors and sort of ending with readers. So this is kind of a, a one-way process. And the readers are kind of at the end of this process, only tenuously linked to the authors at the beginning of the process. So many good things to be said about Danton's system, and lots of people have said those, and I'm not running down Danton at all. However, some people um, see sort of limitations in the Danton approach. So that was the my macro approach. And the micro approach emphasizes agency. People don't like to think that they are sh totally shaped by social forces. They say, no, I'm a free, I have a free will as an individual. I can do things. I can resist. I can fight back. And so... Um, Michel de Certeau, I think people have kind of leapt on board with Michel de Certeau since the 1980s. Um, they find his, uh, well, let's, I just want to say something about this particular quote before I move on to other quotes. But, um, so he's, he's sort of kicking back against this notion that the whole thing starts with the author. So he's kicking back against authorial in intention and saying, well, cultural consumption um, also creates ways of knowing. So it's not just a matter of the author. But then what really kind of propels De Certo to the forefront is this metaphor of poaching, which we see in many places, to the point where he now where one hardly even has to reference De Certo when one talks about poachers. And so here are two very, very famous um, quotes from De Certo, particularly the second one, nomads poaching their way across fields they didn't write, despoiling the wealth of Egypt to enjoy it themselves. Now, I want to spend a lot of time talking about Deserto. could do that. could spend the next hour doing that, so I'm not going to do that. There are some points here that I personally have problems with the poaching uh, metaphor. But back to the micro and the macro, you know, how, so how do we reconcile this top-down and bottom-up approach? And so here I'm drawing on the work of sociologist Paul DiMaggio. comes out of new institutionalism, 
Um, if you want to start, there's a, a, a citation at the top there. He says, there's a layer in between the macro and the micro. He calls it the meso. And he says, it's organizations in contemporary society, and I would argue that this goes back into the, at least the second half of the 19th century. It's organizations that create this middle layer um, that help us bridge the gap between structure and agency, uh, between macro and micro. And it is at the organizational level that individuals actually experience the structuring forces of the wider society, and also it's where they can exercise agency to change the wider society. So, how is that relevant to print culture? Well, first of all, the historical point that organizational sites of reading increase over the 19th century um, so that more and more people are reading in, in organizational contexts from the, uh, so certainly from the middle of the 19th century onwards. Um, and those organizational sites consist of non-commercial sites as well as the commercial sites that get so many, so much attention in print culture his, historical scholarship. Um, so um, there are some examples in the bottom right-hand corner of the kinds of non, some non-commercial kinds of um, almost ephemeral text, like the text that James was talking about on yesterday, um, the sort of jobbing printing or forms and the ways that many other ways in which people come into context as, with print other than the purely literary um, context. And then the third point, the last point I want to make here is that reading and writing, which Danton has very separated, you know, authors at one end and readers at the other, I'm looking for ways in which reading and writing overlap um, and intersect. So I don't see readers as necessarily in a separate c category um, from writers. So most of this is written up in the article that you in the top right hand corner. Um, but now I'm going to a new stage. Um, so I'm asking, well, actually, within the organizations, how does this happen? And for that, I'm drawing on the work of a Canadian sociologist called Dorothy E. Smith. She's a feminist sociologist. She's a Marxian. She's very kind of top down. And I do see the limitations in what she's done. But she's very helpful for me in that she brings institutions and texts into her analysis. And here are three books that I've found. She has a, she's written a lot, but here are three books that I've found particularly helpful in thinking about this. So Smith is also interested, not in the print culture context, but she's interested in how the relationship of people to institutions. Um, and she has these key concepts. The first one she uses a lot is ruling relations. So there you do see the Marxian influence a lot. I and mean, she's talking about how people are being controlled, and, you know, how power f flows in a sort of top-down kind of way. Um, but then she pointing to institutions as the, the way in which the ruling relations are experienced by people. And so she hears, she says, unlike in the past, you know, in feudalism, for example, Today, we are ruled by people who are at work in corporations, government, professional settings, organizations, universities, public schools, and so on and so on. Um, these are not people that we know necessarily, that we've perhaps hated for years, but these are, on the whole, uh, anonymous people. Um, and although they are, the organizations represent individuals, it is as the organizations are the sort of the actors here. Um, the capacity of the individual to act, she says, is derived from the organizations and the institutions. So she says it is the text, is the material object that brings into actual contexts or reading, a standardized form of images. So she's pointing to standardization and she's also pointing to the translocality of texts. So that is what gives organizations their reach beyond the here and now and the, the specific um, space. So she's saying it's through the reading and writing of texts that the local and the particular meets the translocal and the standardized, the standardized, this is my word, the standardized. So that's where the micro and the macro meet. So those are the ideas that I'm going to bring to bear, or I am bringing to bear on those organizational contexts that I listed in that earlier slide where I talked about the Book Lovers Club, the Radio Homemakers Wire 
um, the, you know, the extension work, and so on, and, and the library. So that's the kind of um, general, um, almost sort of meta-theoretical um, background. I'm going to stop there. Um, I've just got a few, very few quick pictures. Uh, so Clarestine Scott, this is the primary sources. Don't ignore the, the, the importance of home economics. I mean, second wave feminism couldn't say enough bad stuff about home economics. But for, uh, for women in the progressive era, it was a way to get out of the house legitimately. And, and it uh, persisted through the, into the, well into the 20th century. Um, so it was a way for women to legitimize what they were doing and to sort of um, gain status and um, agency, I guess. And here are some examples of some of the newspapers that Clara Steen Scott um, vote for. So that's, that's, my, that's my speech. Thank you. Uh, thank you to you both. Um, so for the last you know, several weeks, I've been sending all of you emails and uh, reminders of the, there's this much time available for each uh, presentation. And so I, I start to think, well, boy, I better be sure that I fit the time slot that I gave myself. So I wrote out my comments. Uh, and then as I sit here listening, I'm like starting writing all the other things. So I don't know how it's going to work in terms of uh, presenting it now. I'm not even sure if I can read my own handwriting um, uh, in all these. Um, the, the other thing I'll say is that um, uh, last week, well, actually, it was about two weeks ago now. You know, I knew I would have a lot to do in the, in the week preceding the conference. And so I diligently read both papers. And, and wrote up my comments. And at the time, they seemed really fresh and original. <laughs> now, after the last day and a half of conversation, I don't think that I'm going to say anything, uh, or, or all, not all that much that's, that's particularly new. I have, I have more to say about cosmopolitanism, as if that wasn't already uh, uh, well discussed. Uh, I also want to go back to Middletown again. Um, and so I, I apologize in advance for constantly returning there. But one of the, you know, as I read these two papers in succession, and I read them in the order in which they were uh, presented, uh, I couldn't help but really begin to think about uh, our work, the work that Frank and I are now engaged in, in dealing with our database, our generalized mass uh, that we're trying to make sense of. So it was, uh, in, in two different ways, it was really delightful to, uh, to read these papers. Uh, um, in the case of uh, Julianne's paper, it, the problem you're wrestling with is the problem that we've been wrestling with now for uh, a, a, more, a couple of years, really, since we got our hand, we got the data in enough order to try to begin to make sense of it. So it was really helpful to read the paper and to see how somebody else is dealing with just the same kind of, uh, of issue uh, and problem. And so we, believe me, uh, you know, we're going to be putting to use some of the things that you're doing here very quickly um, as we go forward. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, I have the paper by Christine, of course, is by a person who's already done exactly this. <laughs> She's made sense of, what did you say, 19,000? Uh, loan, loans in, in, of data. So she's done this. So you know it's pretty fortuitous. And and the, her book on Osage has, has been. It was the first book I think we read when we started out on this project. Um, and the other thing that makes me glad that both that uh, yeah, I got to read her paper, but also that that she came is that it was about eight years ago that you came out and just as we were beginning uh, our work on what Middletown read and uh, we found out about your book and so we you came out and nicely gave us a lot of advice and suggestions. Uh, and, and so forth, um, and, and it was very helpful. And Frank and I were quite sure that you know, you know, we'd knock this out in two or three years, and uh, everything would be fine. <laughs> uh, and here we are, eight years later, still trying to make sense of it, uh, and, and not quite uh, there yet. Uh, the other thing I, I will say is, during that visit, I remember this. I don't know if you remember this, Christine, but uh, we had dinner together. Uh, and I think Rob, you you came out that night uh, as well. And I was talking to Christine about, you know, so what do we do with this? How do you know? How should we? Uh, you know, develop sort of scholarly production out of this. And you suggested a conference. Uh, and she said, you get some people who've used the data or are doing similar kinds of work uh, and, um, and bring them out here. And so that was really the seed for this gathering. So uh, thank you again uh, for that uh, as well. Um, and so um, <clears throat> the thing that she did in the Osage work, and the thing that I think she does in, in this paper as well, is really sort of contextualized reading, it, you know, grounded in a particular place, in a particular set of circumstances, um, and really give us a good sense of how 
uh, reading and writing uh, operates on the ground. Um, and so I, I want to pick up on that and, and talk about ways where these two papers came together in my mind as I wrestled with this problem of too much data. Uh, <clears throat> that's something that I don't think humanity scholars are, are used to asking themselves. <laughs> this is not, this is a new problem uh, for us. Um, and, and so I, I don't mean to suggest that, that this is just about my agenda and, and uh, my work. I think that the, the way these two papers work together can point us toward um, addressing some of the issues we've been talking about over the last uh, six sessions or so, and, and I hope we'll continue to talk about uh, going forward. Uh, and in particular, um, <clears throat> they do a couple of things. One is they underscore what we've all, I think, now um, uh, agreed upon, which is that there, uh, there are challenges and problems in, in dealing with the cosmopolitan provincial divide or the metropole periphery uh, divide. Um, like that was the thing that seemed so fresh two weeks ago, but now seems uh, pretty well uh, ground pretty well covered. I have a little more to say about that, but uh, uh, only a little bit. Um, but the other thing I think it does is uh, go back to a, a challenge that Wayne once uh, uh, laid before us or brought up when, because after Christine came, we asked Christine, who, who else should come? And she said, Wayne, Wiegand. And so we invited Wayne. He came out the next year and, and was very helpful as well. And one of the things he said, and then he wrote in some of the proposals that, in support of some of the proposals we put out, uh, to fund this was that the, the database we had allowed us to get at not just who read what, but gets us close to understanding why. Uh, and that's a question that we were just talking about this morning, uh, a number of us, uh, and so forth. And so as I return to my work a little bit, uh, I want to get, get at that question of why and how perhaps by combining some of the approaches you see in these two papers, we can start to get at that why question a little bit more. And this also touches, I think, a bit on what Lynn was talking about earlier, why do happy endings resonate in, in particular circumstances or for particular uh, groups of, uh, of people. So I will say also that one of the things that got X'd out of my, my talk was uh, a comment about how, uh, in particular, um, Darton's circuit just didn't work here, and particularly that those boxes just went nowhere near explaining Clarestine. So I'm glad I cut that out because uh, you addressed that uh, uh, much better than, than I would have. Um, in that case. So let me turn first to, to Julianne's paper. And, and what I have to say about that is, is nothing that she doesn't already know. In fact, nothing that she hasn't already said in the last uh, half hour uh, or so. Um, I was very impressed with the way that uh, she was able to sift through the, the, uh, the records at the Lamston Institute and get at those, those, those commonalities amongst readers. It's something that we've been trying to do with much less success and much less sophistication. Uh, although with Steve's help, we've gotten a little bit better at that. Um, uh, in, in the last year or so uh, with this. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> one, uh, one of the points that, I th that you mentioned again, and, and I th but was really more in passing, is I think very interesting, is that uh, Lambton's library patrons themselves constitute a reading community of sorts, that their reading differs from the other, the, the other groups of readers at the other libraries in, in the Australian Common uh, Reader Database. And so that seems to me an interesting thing and, and worth uh, developing it well. Um, but I thought the, um, <clears throat> uh, the most interesting thing was the, the two diagrams that didn't quite appear <laughs> uh, on the screen. So that's okay. I, I, had a, my, I had a copy of the paper, so I had a good look at them. And I went online and saw them in color, which is also helpful. Um, and so the, the paper's online, and so you can see them in their correct form um, at any time. All of you, I think, have access uh, to that as well. Um, but the two figures, there were figures 8 and 10, these two visualizations, I thought were really you know, very tantalizing trace evidence of either networks or, or communities of readers in, in Lambton. And the question that you raise and that, that really popped to mind as I was reading it was that, um, you know, what, what, are they networks or are they communities? And it's not that the two things are uh, totally distinct from each other, uh, but, uh, uh, and I don't want to get too much caught up in semantics, but I do think you're referring to two different things. In fact, at one point in the paper, you say communities, and then in parentheses, you say networks, question mark. <laughs> You know, so you're hedging a little bit uh, as well about that. Um, uh, and for me, the networks, as, you know, as we've talked a good bit about uh, today, um, uh, <clears throat> indicate connections, in this case, at least common tastes or, or reading interests. Um, but the term doesn't necessarily apply an awareness of those uh, conditions. It may. I'm not saying it, it excludes that, but it doesn't automatically uh, include that, that, that common awareness. Uh, the word community, I think, does. I mean, if you belong to a community, uh, you're, um, <clears throat> the, the word conveys a sense of belonging. The members realize that they're members of that community. They're aware of at least some of the connections uh, but between them. 
uh, in this case. And so the, the clusters that you've done such a good job of, uh, of picking out, they may be reading communities, but they may be something uh, a little different. So we need to know more, and you know that. I'm not telling you anything that you haven't already uh, or acknowledged. Uh, but we need to be precise about also about what constitutes a reading community. That's a, that's a word, imagined communities and so forth, that we've kicked around a good bit uh, here. So sometimes a, a little bit of um, um, rigor in our definitions of some of these terms uh, it can be useful. Um, and so, you know, when you think about the ways we've talked about communities, you, uh, there's been a lot today about imagined communities, and I, cer I certainly think that's uh, in evidence here. Um, <clears throat> but also, you know, if you go back to an older tradition, the sort of Gemeinschaft, Gesellschaft notion of face-to-face -face communities that, that fade away in, in modern life, that's a much different understanding of what a community is that, that um, uh, was very powerful in sociology for, for quite a long time and, and shaped a lot of historical writing uh, as well. So uh, maybe some of these clusters you see, including the clusters in, in, in figure 10 that you said weren't your, fa you, know, you didn't think those were as impressive. I, I thought those were the most interesting to me uh, because it means there's a lot of little things, patterns going on. Some of them may be coincidental, but, but many of them may suggest the trace evidence of some kind of social interaction and what that interaction is. Uh, I don't know. There's a lot going on even in a fairly small community like, like Lambton um, in, in this place. Um, <clears throat> Um, the other possibility is, of course, is those clusters represent not so much a community, but um, a, a little piece of an audience or a little piece of a, a market whose members don't really know each other and are only connected not, you know, even though they may perhaps live down the street from each other, they're connected through the library and through a publisher, through an author located in Sydney, located in London, mm -hmm. wherever it might be. And so the lines of connection run out and back in rather than across the community uh, in, in this way. Um, and, and so... <clears throat> As I said, you know this. Um, you, you write about how we have to go back to the details of the records, readers, and books themselves before we can draw clear conclusions. You know the, the work. There's plenty of work li that lies ahead, uh, obviously, uh, in these situations. Uh, you close by suggesting we need a, a literary analysis of the books that are borrowed by readers, and that's certainly, I, I think, correct, and I think that's, that's the case. But I also think you really have to dig into the social history yeah, okay. uh, of the place uh, quite well. Uh, to make sense of these clusters, this trace evidence we see in the, in the circulation data, we need to know a good bit about demography in the town, social geography, ethnic and religious character, the public life, the, the, the civil society, and all these institutions that Christine has been uh, emphasizing. Um, and so perhaps you need to, you've got your computer scientist, now you've got to go get your social historian. Yes, I know. I know. Uh, you need to yeah. find I, me I, one I, of those. More and more, <laughs> I do think that these, these kinds of projects work best collaboratively uh, rather than just Excellent. one of us digging in, uh, which is, at least for historians, I think that's the norm, is that, that you go and do this all by yourself in the library and the archive. Well, literary um, studies as well. You know, yeah, yeah, and so I think there's an opportunity here where you, you draw in together a group of people to do uh, mm -hmm. uh, this kind of work. So uh, let me turn for a few minutes now to, to Christine's uh, uh, paper. Um, and so where, um, where Julianne starts out with a mass of people, uh, Christine brings us into focus with just one person. Um, and so we can set aside the difficulty of generalizing from any one individual case. That's always a, a, an issue and a challenge. I think the advantage here is that we get in very sharp relief some of those interactions, some of the uh, the social activity around reading that helps define uh, and direct reading. We see the institutions, we see the social ties, the values that, that are uh, shaping and defining um, Clara Steen's life. Uh, <clears throat> um, and so the role of reading and writing, reading and writing in relation to the home, the family, church, community, schools, all these institutions is really clear when you have this, this, this much tighter focus. We also get uh, a, a really good sense of the importance of print uh, in this person's life. This is, we're talking about West Liberty, Iowa for mo most of her life, which I, I, you know, got out my Google Maps and, and, and saw where it was. And uh, I had a little mini debate in my mind about which place was more isolated, West Liberty, Iowa or Lambton, uh, New South Wales, Australia. And it's, I think it's a tie. <laughs> uh, it, they're, they're pretty isolated. Um, and, and so you have this image in the paper of the newspaper room shelves collapsing in this mass of newsprint. I love that because it was, you know, it was really sort of very graphic evidence of just how important, how central print was. And you make this point that they have a room uh, devoted to print. Um, so it, this is a big piece of uh, the lives of these people uh, living there. So um, I, I really like the, you know, the emphasis on the complex of institutions that, that, that shapes her life and so forth. Uh, and I was interested as well in, um, 
the way you uh, talked about the, the theoretical and, and the literature background here in the presentation today that isn't, isn't part of this paper. Um, and I like the idea of between structure and agency, there's this middle ground, uh, another phrase that's, that we've used in a different context, um, <clears throat> uh, where institutions operate to shape people's lives and experiences. I, I would want to add to that uh, one other thing, and it comes from my work in, in uh, uh, urban history, and that is place. Uh, when, when we're thinking about structure and agency, we, we often think about the mediating um, realm to be a, a place. And there's a terrific essay by, um, by Charles Tilley called What Good is Urban History? in which he sort of argues that you want to study communities not as uh, individual entities that, that operate entirely separately from any other community or any other patterns, but rather places that contour larger patterns. So Tilly uses the example, for instance, of industrialization. You know, this mass world historical uh, shift that takes place in, in the modern period, something we talked about in the opening session yesterday. Well, individual places shape exactly how that process is, is experienced. And so the experience of industrialization in uh, Muncie, Indiana is, is quite different than it is in Newcastle, uh, in, in Australia, or in other places because you have different social structures and you have different inst networks and, of institutions and, and so forth. So I think to complement uh, the institutions, I think a focus on place would be, would be quite valuable. And so you have those cases you're going to do. And you're in Cleveland, you're in Des Moines, and so forth. Well, uh, pay attention to the places, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think. Uh, it'll be a way to make sense of the, the institutions as well, uh, I think, very nicely. Um, the other thing that came to mind in terms of your, your reference to institutions for me was uh, some reading I did in graduate school. It seems every commenter has to refer to something that happened in graduate school or something they read in, in graduate school. So I will offer, uh, for my part, uh, a reading I did in political science in what was called the New Institutionalism. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, and Theta Scotchpole would be the name most closely associated with this probably. This was, was big in the 1980s, and the argument that these political scientists made, mostly about the state, but it applies to other institutions, is that they are their own entities. They have their own histories, uh, and so they develop in particular ways, and they are not, in, sort of, in older sort of Marxist formulations, they, they were the outgrowth of social processes. Uh, but what these political scientists were arguing is no, they are their own entities that shape how history unfolds, that shape how identities take shape. Uh, and so you treat the institutions as uh, active factors in, in your analysis, and, they and you, do the, you look at the history of that institution and how that, in turn, shaped the interactions of people on the ground in, in, in these various places. So I don't know how much political science, is, science you want to add to your reading, but... Uh, well, that's uh, what DiMaggio comes out of that. Does he? All right, I yes. didn't know DiMaggio. Okay, so I, I haven't read this since graduate school, so I didn't realize DiMaggio was part of that. So good, all right. That was even more appropriate than I yeah, thought. Yeah. So. Uh, <clears throat> so now, so I, I, you know, I, I do want to echo a point that we've made now uh, a good bit, um, is that, you know, in particularly in reading Christine's paper, these categories of cosmopolitan and provincial, just they're, they're very difficult to apply, not only because of the slipperiness of, of the definition of the terms, uh, and not only in my mind because of the, uh, the negative connotations associated with the, with the term provincial, but, but also because if you look at Clara Steen, I, I don't think she's a cosmopolitan. I don't think she quite meets even the definition that you use for Bragdon. But she's not, she's not a provincial in, in any sense. She's a very thoroughly engaged person with the world around her um, and, and has this, this very uh, rich set of connections, not only to her community, but to uh, you know, uh, the Midwest, to, um, uh, to, to uh, farm families, uh, to uh, a religious community, uh, and so forth. Um, and I liked as well the way you point out that this domestic identity that's embodied in Homec and, and, and other things um, um, was a, um, a platform for engaging the world, not a, a straitjacket, I think is a word you use. Uh, it was a framework for engaging with the world, not something that got in the way of, uh, of trying to do that. So, so I, 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 as I said, I really appreciated both papers. I thought they were terrific and interesting. Um, and I, I, I've left myself a couple of minutes to just briefly talk about um, <clears throat> some of the um, <clears throat> uh, ways in which this got me thinking about my own work uh, and uh, the work that Frank and I, should, I should say, are doing uh, together with this. Um, <clears throat> we too, um, Frank and I, see, I think, traces in our data that are similar to some of the, um, um, the, the evidence that you are able to tease out of your mass of, uh, of data. Um, and we're not... Um, <clears throat> necessarily as sophisticated as, as you are, but I, I do think we have detected this. Um, 
Um, and I think we can borrow from Christine in our work this emphasis on institutions. And it brought to mind a particular part of uh, what we've been trying to do uh, in, in our, uh, I can't say forthcoming yet, but our, our, our book in, in progress uh, at, at this point. Um, <clears throat> There's a chapter in the book uh, that examines the work of the, uh, the Women's Club of Muncie, uh, which is one of uh, uh, many women's clubs that form in late 19th and early 20th century America. This is a very common phenomenon in cities of various sizes around the country uh, in this period. It starts out as a literary society. It's a, it's a group that gets together every couple of weeks and, and uh, gives the women give papers, read papers about stuff that they've been reading. Now, sometimes it's travel literature, often it's fiction, sometimes it's history. Uh, as well. During the 1890s, they make a transition from being a purely literary society to a society that is increasingly focused on social reform. And this is a very common transformation amongst women clubs in the United States in, in this period. They become uh, focused on poverty, inequality, pollution, uh, dealing with a variety of urban social problems uh, that are arising in Muncie as they are in, in most other cities uh, during the late 19th century. Um, and so most of the accounts I've read of, of these organizations, they note the shift from literature to social issues, uh, and that's really all they have to say about it. They, the, the implication seems to be that the literary discussions just fade away and, and they, off they go on to discussing uh, various social issues. But an interesting thing about this particular club is that the literary discussions don't go away. One is they alternate meetings in the 1890s between literature and social problems. They have one and the other each of the two weeks. But even in the, in the meetings devoted to social problems, they're reading novels. Uh, and so the discussions all center around uh, various novels. So for instance, uh, they read Hall Caine's uh, The Christian to get a better understanding of prostitution. It's a, the lead, uh, one of the main characters is a, um, uh, a prostitute. Um, uh, they read Albion Tourget's Merville Eastman Christian Socialist to, to talk about the role of church in addressing uh, urban social problems. They read Charles Sheldon's Born to Serve um, as um, a way of exploring the experiences of domestic servants and figuring out how you can reform uh, the lives of domestic servants um, uh, today, and these are women, I should say, many of whom had domestic servants uh, in that case. They read a, a, a German translation of Bertha von Suttner's Die Waffen uh, It's translated in our data as ground arms, uh, which is a terrible translation. I think lay down your arms or something like that is, is better. But that was how the library translated it in the 1890s. So, um, uh, and anyway, because they were exploring uh, peace movements. Um, and so, um, and so they, it's not that they never read nonfiction, but very frequently they turned to novels as a way of dealing with these social problems uh, and addressing these social problems. And I think there's a lot of reasons why this was going on, and some of it has to do with where they were. Um, I think in Chicago, women could get away with trotting off into the slums and compiling statistics and issuing reports. Uh, but in, in a more conservative place like Muncie, Indiana, that was pretty risky behavior for women in the 1890s. What was much safer was reading books, reading novels. They've been doing that for a while, and so this was a way to kind of disguise their really political activities uh, that they were engaging in uh, in this way. Um, <clears throat> um, I think also in, all these books, as far as I can tell, feature in some way very strong female characters. So I think that it was a way of identifying with women who had agency to shape uh, the, the world around them. Uh, and um, <clears throat> they all had happy endings. Um, and so I don't know that, you know, I think that suggests to me that th these problems were soluble, that this is a way of reassuring them that the efforts they were making were soluble. So again, we don't have the, the, the proof in this, but it's a really very interesting coincidence, almost too much of a coincidence to really not think there's something more going on there uh, in this situation. Um, now, the advantage we have here is that we can go figure out what, what else these people were reading, um, these women reading, besides what appears in the minutes of, of this one club. And so we go into our data, and uh, we were able to isolate 62 of the members of this, this club, uh, which is a little more than half of, of the active membership. Uh, and those 62 were people who had borrowed from uh, the public library during this, this period. Uh, <clears throat> And what happened is we got a list. We don't have the, the bubble graphs and things yet. We're, we're going to have to get to that. But we, we, we did sort of compile a list of what were the most commonly read books amongst this group. And it's a, it's a considerably different list uh, when you compare it to the list of the books most often read by middle class women as a whole in, in, the, in our data. Uh, or I should say white collar women. I made the big speech yesterday about not saying middle class, so I got to be careful. Uh, so women of comparable social backgrounds uh, read different things than this group did. And I, I don't want to make too much of this, and Frank and I have gone back and forth a bit about this and, and exactly how to interpret uh, these lists, but there's a little bit more, uh, there's social realism. You don't see any sort of 
harder edged realism in uh, the reading of most women in the library. But these women, uh, this, you know, a couple of the most popular books for them are Rebecca Harding Davis's Francis Waldo and Mary Eleanor Wilkins Freeman's Jerome, a poor man, both of which are very much uh, in the sort of the realist uh, uh, movement of the period. They read a lot of local color re regional fiction, uh, very little of which appears in the top uh, most frequently um, read books or borrowed books by women from, from other groups. Uh, there's, there's a good amount of historical fiction. There is a little bit of uh, what we might call lighter romance uh, in, in all of this as well. Uh, but these, reading these two papers got me to think about, well, that's the trace evidence we have of sort of some, you know, some patterns within this mass of data. And then here are the, here's an institution that seems to be at least shaping a portion of the, the reading lives uh, of these women. And it's, it's really only a portion. Um, in <clears throat> if you look at individuals, you see that their reading is all over the place. There's some of this kind of reading. Uh, there's, there's some of the lighter fiction. Um, and then there's reading that's shaped by their personal circumstances. The, the, the leading temperance reformer in town is checking out books related to temperance. Some of the, um, the other members who have children are, are more likely to borrow children's books, not, not surprisingly, uh, in, in all this. So uh, I just offer that as an example of the way in which these two really interesting papers got me to thinking about some of the same kinds of problems that they're wrestling with. Um, and so I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more about what you guys are doing and following what, how the, these projects unfold, uh, in, in, not in the least because it'll, it's really going to help me uh, move ahead with some of the stuff that, that, that we're trying to do. So thank you for the papers. Uh, I want to open it up to the floor uh, for questions unless you guys have anything you want to say or add. I might briefly. That's sure. Okay. Just yeah. a couple of things. Um, this question of why Lampton was different from the other libraries is, mm -hmm. I think, a really interesting one. And I think there's two things that we don't know enough about, and that's demographic differences. Yeah. I think, I suspect, probably migration probably has something right. to do with that, different patterns of migration. But also how they got their books, so accession records, I think. Is, right. You know, that, I think that would, would be And the interplay between, between the, 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 users the users and, and the library. And, yeah, yeah. So there was, a, yeah. at Lampton, there was a suggestion book that apparently was used fairly heavily. So you, so patrons would, would write their suggestions and the, and the Do you have that? Uh, no, no. Um, but we do have the minutes for the the minutes for the meetings where the committee argy bargied about what they would buy and what they wouldn't. So that will probably give us some indication as to what was suggested and whether it was right. taken up. Um, but I haven't I haven't been able to look at them yet. I'm planning to. Good. <laughs> yeah. um, this other question, I guess, I'd like to open it up to everyone. This question about the relationship between reading communities and reading networks. Mm -hmm. And what you were saying just then made me think about well, what what I'm I guess what this kind of data can tell us about is maybe not necessarily the nature of these communities, but the, but the conditions of possibility for this kind of communities, communities based on reading, so for literary sociability. And I guess what, what you were saying was kind of made me think, well, what, the, another way of posing that question is, what kinds of conversations might be enabled by having this reading in common? You know, so thinking right. about, you yeah. know, which is obviously it's a cause what this, and effect, yeah. yeah. Um, but this question, I, I set out looking for communities of readers, thinking about self-conscious communities. And I think looking at the data itself has made me realise there's, there's probably a lot of, I think network is probably a more accurate way of describing what's happening in library loan data because there's lots of relationships crisscrossing in every direction. Right. Um, and so I guess, yeah, so it, it is actually, there, there might be, communities in the sense that we're defining them as such, but they're not self-conscious communities. They're not imagined communities. They're, they're groups of people with, with practices in common. Whether they are aware of that commonality, it's very difficult to know. Right. So I'm curious to, see, to hear what other people think about this question of reading communities and networks. Christine, do you have any? No, I'll just go on to the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was thinking the same thing about communities. It's like the question that Two questions came to my mind in rapid succession. One is, when, um, when is it a community? Mm. Right? And I, 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 you know, I don't think I would go along with Jim's answer is that it's a community when you know mm. that you're in it, right? I mean, you're in a network in the morning when you pick up an orange and eat it, right? Because of the network. The you have a relationship to your, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, the, the second question, and this is the one that I think is really cutting across everything for me right now, is, following up on when do you have a community, when can you, the scholar, know it, right? I mean, it seems like all three of these papers really are trying to get at this by enriching the cultural context and the historical context. It's like, so we've got this, 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 and this, and so we're that close to saying we've got community, like that we've got a reading community happening or something like that. I mean, your paper raises this really tantalizing notion that 
uh, reading communities can be interpretive communities. Mm -hmm. And so maybe these two guys who pass each other on the street outside the mine, who've read the same 183 books together, <laughs> right, maybe they also read them the same way, yeah. right, because they've had the opportunity either to be educated in the same way or to talk to each other about it, right. Mm -hmm. But as with so many of the kind of um, methodological problems that are coming up, it always comes down to the sort of empirical thing, mm -hmm. right? Can we really demonstrate that the thing existed? You know, Joan, your, your comment from yesterday about, um, uh, you know, it's not enough to just stop and say well, that people are reading for escape, mm -hmm. right? right? You've got you've to get uh, uh, social t uh, contextual history oh, that sort of, you know, yeah. can say something about why people are reading for escape, right? right? Well, part of the problem with that is, right, unless, you know, you've got diaries and letters, right, um, and all kinds of stuff that dominates, that, that documents that. But at the same time, there's also this, um, there's also this problem of, as far as I know, now, some folks in this room probably know this better than I do, but everything I've read that had, you know, serious hard data about reader response, I'm thinking about, like, mass observation in England and, uh, Hugh D. Levis's uh, book about fiction in the reading public, everybody always says that they read for escape. You know, like 97% of readers read for escape. Right, but that's, as someone, um, what, yeah. um, it, it was actually the cultural historian Warren Sussman, who was a teacher of mine in graduate school. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, he always said it's the form of the escape that matters. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to say what mm -hmm. that people are reading. So first. it's not just cause, it's also form. Uh, right. Saying. It's the particular kind of escape. Isn't that what, isn't that what? seems a very problematic word. Right. right. If you think of Janice Radway. Exactly what I was going to say. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Would fit that category, but that's right. not what she shows at all. No. Right. And it always makes me uncomfortable to talk about reading for escape, because actually if you're, if you're me and you're reading about a French novel in the 19th century, I don't read it to escape from my life. I read it to bring into my right. life. Mm. So it seems to me often reading is an inclusive rather than mm. an exclusive act which is a very different thing from escaping somehow where you... you don't well, it may have to do with the questioner, too, yeah. right? I mean, the questioner may be phrasing, the social scientist may be phrasing the question in a way that's going to elicit mm. the sort of notion of escape. Mm. Um, but, well, yeah. It's derogatory, isn't it? Mm. Yes. Right. It builds into the question, you know, it's expecting the answer, you know, I recognize that what I'm doing is not really quite, yes, I'm in great quite good in life, life, and I could have a better yes. one in my head. Yeah. But it doesn't seem to me that's the answer. It's I was going to say precisely the same thing in, in, in relation to Jan Radway's work, because mm. exactly, that's exactly what it does. It, get, it gets rid of that condescension mm. yeah. about yeah. the one yeah. uses yeah. cases. Yeah. But the problem is, at least, and I'm not, at least in the original work that, 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 that Jan did, of course, it, it was in terms of, of she had living. Yeah. Report subjects, she, uh, subjects yeah. and she can frame the questions yeah. and so forth. So we go yes. back yes. to the, the the problem of recovery and retrieval from this this this, this very fragile material that we have, mm -hmm. where we can't actually set the agenda or the questions that we really I want to ask. I was just going to ask Julie <clears throat> in relation to the kind of available data you might have. Was there an associational culture in in um, Lambton, and is there are there any records of that? Because are there other places in which these people? I mean, the two things that seem to me to make a bit of sense of the reading patterns, if you can discover them, are age. Because mm. if you've got a group of people reading Dickens and so forth, that could be that they're connected generationally. Mm. But the other thing that might connect people is other kinds of association. Yeah, so age, we don't have any age information for these patrons, and that's something that I could go back and, and do for at least some of them. So I'd like to get a small army to do that for me. Um, but associations, yes. So there, in all these mining communities, there was a very, no literary organisations, but friendly societies, that kind of organisation basically that existed to, um, to maintain kind of um, a social safety net for the, for the miners, basically, who were working in a quite a dangerous occupation. But also they're quite sort of dense civic organisations as well. So, and there is a sort of kind of social body of social history. There's a very active local history organisation in Newcastle that has done a bit of, a bit of work on this. Um, unfortunately, they don't often tell us much about the people who were involved. Um, but once the local newspaper is digitised, I'm hoping that some of this might come out, you know, reports of meetings and so on, so I can begin to find out about how yeah. people did associate, what, which people were associating in, in, these, in these groups and institutions. But, yeah, I was thinking about that during your paper as well, beginning to look more closely at these kinds right. of institutions that aren't literary, they actually aren't, don't have anything to do with literature, but were how people, are, you know, the way of structuring this, this community. Mary had her hand up. Uh, so. Yeah, um, I just wanted to get, keep on this topic of community 
but also of escape. And I think a lot of times when we think of escapist reading, we're thinking of the solitary, silent reader. Mm -hmm. But I haven't heard too much discussed about oral reading and group reading. And I'm wondering if our notions of escapism would have to change when we do discuss that, um, groups and, and oral. I could say something a little bit about that. The mm -hmm. example of Star Clara Steen, she systematically reads with her sister mm -hmm. and maybe with other young women. Um, they read to each other. And I think maybe it comes out of that culture, which you've talked about in your, in your article about Daniel, whatever his name was. In Child. What? His name? Child. Child, yes, right. Mm -hmm. Right, so there's this. So Daniel Child reads to his wife every evening while she's sewing or mending or, or whatever. And perhaps that was what was going on with these young women. Um, so it was, they turned this chore into a pleasurable time for everybody. <coughs> yeah. I, I think one can add to that the, sorry. the women's clubs, for example, that started to things were being uh, read aloud. And we've, Written we've, and read, so this yes. is about the production um, as well as... Uh, and, um, and acted we, out. Yeah, uh, and in addition to that, we, I think since the Madison conference, we found uh, a fourth contemporary diary of somebody who was uh, involved with the library, and he was a 13-year-old, and he would borrow books, and then um, he would get either his sister or his mother to read to him, you know, so there is evidence of that, of that kind. Um, I'm not coming to this uh, discussion of escape as a, a professional in this area. I'm a linguist, and um, I just wanted to mention that um, probably, uh, maybe this is obvious, but probably the average person has a different understanding of the word escape mm -hmm. in that context from what professionals do. And for me, as a reader, and not in the literary world, um, I think of reading for escape as, um, and I do think of it that way, but it's not that I'm escaping something bad, it's that I'm leaving the bounds of physical time, physical geography, and expanding my experience, escaping into the imagination. So for me, it doesn't have a bad connotation it's a good connotation, and we just might want to think about what the word means to the individuals who are answering the question, maybe something different from uh, what it means to people analyzing the, the response. Okay, and then, oh, well, Wayne has up, then we'll go right up. Let's do okay. uh, I reject the word escape to describe reading. I reject it entirely because it's got a heritage that goes back to the time when they divided life between work and leisure, and escape comes out of that leisure part. It devalues it. It does not, it's not complex enough to explain to us what people do in the act of reading. So I, I, I hate to use it in my own research because I know in the reader's mind it conjures up this, uh, go ahead and waste your time. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't explain, I don't think, what reading does. I was, but I want to, uh, I encourage all of you to read Tom August's The Clerk's Tale, because he uses a phrase in there called liter literacy practices. I love the way that rings for me. And, and so I'm, Julianne, uh, that building you showed us. Mm, yeah. uh, lots of stuff happened in that building. And I'm thinking if Tom Oxt were here, he'd say, I'll bet they engaged in literacy practices. What you have there is a community of people mm. who read things in common, talk about them, mm. uh, come to lectures by individuals who have written book, books, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of which are literacy practices. They did have a very brief lecture program, but it was very badly attended, so they stopped it. <laughs> But obviously they were, there was a newspaper reading room, um, which I suspect, as with Bransmith, you know, it was heavily, heavily used. And there was, there was billiards, which sort of paid the rent. They were, <laughs> they were minors. They were minors, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and minors' wives and also sort of shopkeepers and you know, people who service. But yes, I mean, the, the vast majority of them were minors doing a difficult, dangerous, not very nice job. Yeah. But yes, you're right, it was a centre of a lot of different activities. Yeah. Can I just follow up on that? 
so, so as well as literacy practices or institutional, institutional practices that were going on in that building that are not captured in, in the database either. So one of the ways in which people could get ideas about what they want to read next is the return bookshelf, which is a kind of a standard thing that you often see in libraries. They've, books come back and the librarians don't have time to shove them on the shelf, so they go on the return bookshelf. The next person comes in and they think, oh, what am I going to read? Oh, this, someone's read this, I'll read this. So that's a way of kind of boosting circulation of specific books. No one's pointing people to these books, but the institutional practice is creating a kind of pattern. And, you know, that could well be, that particularly if people right. go at a particular time for whatever other reasons that they have to go to the library at that time, all kinds of patterns can emerge. And, that, you know, and, and while I've got the floor here, we shouldn't forget the materiality of the text. The bindings of text point people to different books as well. So you read a book with a particular binding which is attractive to you and you know that that book delivers a particular kind of happy ending or other message. And I was thinking that particularly in Lynn's talk this, uh, this afternoon, this morning, um, that people may look for books that look like this book. So they follow series that are bound by the same publisher in, in a series and yet has no kind of intellectual connection other than the way, the reasons why the publisher chose to bind them in the same way in the first place. And so. Can I just add to that in terms of the institutional practices? Something that my partner pointed out that hadn't occurred to me is library books can't be read, unless sometimes they have more than one copy, but usually they can't be read simultaneously. So that idea of, you know, the Anderson's imagined community with people reading simultaneously is more or less kind of institutionally precluded from library reading. It's a much more, it's a kind of temporal thing that, you know, with, with long tales. And I think you could probably do more with these databases in looking at your know, trailblazing readers, right. you know, and thinking about those patterns of who read what over, over time, which is something that only Happen, that happens in a unique way in li you know, because of the institutional situation of the library. Yeah. Yeah, we have a couple of hands over here. Anyone go ahead and then we'll come over to James. So. Yeah, this, this might be jumping ahead to something that I imagine Wayne is going to be talking about, but when we start talking about um, institutions that uh, encourage sociality and, and objects around which the social groups um, uh, organize themselves, um, the thing that you immediately think of once you get into this period, like the post-1900 period for the library, is the challenges from other media, so other cultural objects around which um, uh, interest is organized. And in the metropole, that would be maybe museums, either the big art museums or the big uh, natural history museums. But even in, in very rural places, I would think that the movies um, start to be a different way uh, that people would start sharing their sociality. So that, you know, by 1903, 1904, I'm not, I don't know about the movie history of Ethan Muncy, but I'm sure that by 1905, 1906, I'm sure, given the size of the place, you would expect that there would have at least been several Nickelodeons. Well, there's a, um, in, in our case, I don't know about Lampton, but there's a, a Weiser's Grand Theater that has touring shows coming through beginning in about 1891, I think it is, or 1890. And so that's a, and sometimes they're plays based on novels. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're, it, the first shows, are, the first one is Shakespeare when they open, is the opening show. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so absolutely, I have an example from 1913 of Ivanhoe being shown in Marinette, Wisconsin. And then the librarian comments that following the showing of the silent movie, people are flooding to the library looking for Ivanhoe on the sh shelves of the library. And then she writes an article for the Wisconsin Library Journal recommending that other librarians make this tie in mm. so, so as early as 1913. And, but, but before she publishes it, she checks with Mary Imogen Hazeltine to say, is it okay that I do this, you know, culturally? Should I, am I sticking my neck out? Will people think badly of me because I'm making this connection, this popular mm. culture connection? So right. there's all these anxi anxieties about culture. Uh, Oh, yeah, 1913. Well, there certainly weren't any movies in, in Lampton, but there, were, there was active theatre, um, right. yeah, which had touring shows. And that makes me think of you know, the other things that I'm thinking about doing with is looking at the kind of other intertext for this kind of cultural reception. So the theatre, definitely, but also reviews and newspapers and newspaper serialisation. So beginning to track, you know, some of these writers were serialised in Australian newspapers at the same time as they were quite popular by, re you know, so it's one way of thinking about were these popular because they'd read a bit, you know, they read one section of, a, of the serialised novel and wanted to know what happened next or, you know, whether that was, you know, some of what they were seeing either on, on the stage or what they were reading in newspapers was prompting borrowing in these libraries. 
Mm. I just, I, I, just a funny, because I know you're in Vancouver now, but uh, the, uh, I, I found, I, I was doing some work on um, itinerant um, movie projectionists. So people who would travel around with movies at very early moments, and, and amazingly, 600 miles north of Vancouver, you know, in 1903, there's a guy with his uh, cart showing um, uh, movies to uh, uh, an indig indigenous population um, 600 miles north. So they, they, they reach incredibly distant and remote areas, even at these early moments. It's kind of curious. James, did you? Yeah, I, I want to ask Christine something, but just to follow on um, from what Julianne just said about um, you know, uh, that, that you, you really can't have an, uh, uh, a sort of a reading community at one time, because, because of course that goes back to my 18th century. You know, one thing that I think is under-investigated, difficult to do, but with my 18th century borrowers and 18th century circulating libraries, you're only allowed to borrow one volume at a time from a set. So you've got a three-volume three set. And I just wonder what happens. You've read your first volume, and is the second volume still there, or is it out? Now, in the case of some of my people, um, they have multiple copies, because they're, you know, if you've, you've got this usual thing float, floating around that of that every edition, you know, of these sort of popular novels, every, every edition 400 go to a circulating library. So you've got more than one set in most of the libraries. But even so, you've got some overlap there. So that's another complicating factor. I guess if you're reading serials, you develop the habit of patience, don't you? You know, you have to wait. But until <laughs> yeah, I suppose, but they're not serials. No, no but I mean, it's the same yeah, kind of reading I suppose in it's, chunks. I suppose you know, it is, but it's like a big block. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's disrupt it's, it, yeah. it, it alters our way of what that of of how that reading process goes, because we just yeah. have the, the three sitting there on a, on, yeah. and we read them through. And, and the other know. reading that might happen in the interim, or you wait for Or absolutely, or do you give up? Yeah, or give up. whatever. I wanted to ask, I want to ask Christina, because it was so wonderful to revisit, you know, the influence, the, the people that you said had influenced you, and particularly the later ones. So I'm not at all familiar with, with, with um, Smith and the Connecticut. I'll go to that immediately. But I just wondered where you felt now, because I started yesterday. Um, it was a complete coincidence. that I, I didn't know, you know, that, that Stephen was going to, 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 to say what he did. Um, but I, I also started from a position of scepticism about, as you know, about what print culture is. But I noticed you seemed still happy with the term as you used it, and I wondered if you wanted to reflect on that. Uh, your I, No, you know what? Um, I have been through so many agonizing discussions <laughs> about is this the history of the book or the history of print culture. Um, as the director of the center, what used to be the center for the history of print culture in modern America, I presided over a change to the center for the history of print and digital culture for all kinds of reasons, which I'm not going to reiterate now. So, you know, I just, I'm just, I'm just not going to go there. I mean, I'll just use the word. There's a difference, sorry. Yes, you are. There is a difference. I'm, I'm sort of, if you've got to have a centre, and I did with it, you know, I've set up a new centre because you've got to you know, get, bring people in. And I've gone back because I was unhappy with books, so I, I, for, the, you know, for the hell of it, I, I've called it the, the Centre for Bibliographical History at Essex, okay? And it's doing all sorts of different things and so forth, and it's trying to bring in particularly the non-book print and all these sorts of things. Now, with that, I'm, I'm quite relaxed. I don't really care what the title is of these things. But when we're talking, when, 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 we're, when we're looking at communities and networks and some of the precise discussions that we've had, and the, 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 what I thought Stephen put very well yesterday in terms of, 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 of how... Um, uh, I think my word was the enabling, but he, 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 he talked about it promoting or, so, or something else, and, 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 and a way of amplifying, that was his word, yeah. something that was pre-existing or so forth. I mean, I do, I, I am very sympathetic to that, and I, I, do think that, I do think that quite often in some of the things we read, there is a very slipshod use of the word print culture because it, it, it's so amorphous, and I, I just... Mm -hmm. I just I, I feel I want to get rid of it and, and, and talk about something more precise. Well, it is, it is difficult, actually. I mean, we have a, a, a prize that we give out from the centre. It's a Danke Fellowship. It's $1,000. Should you tell your students about it? And, it, and, and we give the prize for somebody who wants to do... We, we, so the, the, the things they have to do, they have to come to Wisconsin and they have to use the the collections either of the university or the Wisconsin Historical Society and we prefer it if they do it on a project on the history of print culture and so many people just they send in projects and because they are using printed materials of some kind they think this is a print culture um, project so I you know I don't think there's a clear understanding 
amongst us of what we mean by print culture. But I am okay with fuzzy language, really. I, you know, I think that language, it just, it, we create the meanings as we use the language. And if we all like the idea of bibli what, bibliographical what? What did you History. say? <laughs> History. All right. So, I mean, you know, maybe you'll start a new thing there um, and some people will go off in that or maybe some people will split off in other directions. Um, and I think it's good to keep arguing about it. Right. But I think I'm, I'm tired. I'm too rigid to <laughs> cut off those things. I think we have time for one more limb. Do you still have time for yeah, that? Yeah, sure. I have to turn the clock back a little bit to other comments. Okay. But uh, maybe I could first uh, address Brad's comment about the movies. Um, what I understand from a colleague who's in film history is that the early short films actually depend on people having read books uh, mm -hmm. because otherwise uh, you don't know what the plot is <laughs> uh, because they're only you know sort of snippets of it and for continuity it, it relies on that and one of the early shorts was on the old Mamsell secret of uh, one of these German books uh, which as a sort of some proof of its reading and then the second thing was to the reading and uh, group reading and um, again this is a little far afield from the American scene but it pertains to it in the end because of this translation uh, Marlet was the companion to the uh, local duchess for 10 years, and her chief occupation was reading books aloud to her. Mm -hmm. So I think I could probably guess that she, one of the books she read aloud maybe more than once was Jane Eyre, and I assume that that's also how she sort of got her ideas for writing and a sense of genre and so forth mm -hmm. and so on. So this business of group reading has other kinds of mm -hmm. um, interesting ramifications, I think. And then the last thing, I wanted to ask uh, Julianne a question. Because um, I was interested in the suggestion box mm -hmm. and the fact that your readers were reading such contemporary things and they're in this place that's kind of far away from everything. How did they, what were they reading uh, where they had news of books that they might be interested to read? Was there some very rich culture of reviewing or reporting? Or well, like I had a look, um, you know how I showed you that, that graph of the, I had a look for each of those authors just in the digitised, there's a trove database of digitised Australian newspapers and it was clear that for the top five authors they were all being reviewed and most of them serialised in Australian newspapers at the same time. So there's clearly, I mean I don't know the cause and effect, but they were clearly being, dis being discussed in the print, you know, in, in, the, in the newspapers at the time. Um, so I presume that's where they, where they where they found out. And there's, um, there's quite a, a cool thing you can use to look at, um, to visualise the, the newspaper database where they show you that, you know, how many mentions there were of, of your search term over, over time. And in some cases, for example, E. Phillips Oppenheim, it more or less matches the readership in Lampton. You know, so it, it's clearly there is a relationship between the serialisation and the reviewing and, and the reading, yeah. All right, I think we're about three o'clock, so thanks. Thank you to both of you. Yeah.